the enemy is defeated. Jesus is alive. And that's what we celebrate this weekend. But let's take this back <laughs> to Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of this week. And what I want to talk about today, and you probably could have imagined it, but anyway, our title today is Easter. Blind Faith or Evidence? Blind Faith or Evidence? I don't know if you can read it there, but the caption says, how can something that physically happen? And that's the key. How can something that physically happened almost 2,000 years ago, something physically happened 2,000 years ago, how could it turn out to be nothing or not true or unreal or didn't happen, but yet it has reframed history. All of human history has been reframed by an event that actually happened. In other words, something actually happened even if you never had a Bible, never read about it, something happened. Something physically happened. And here at GTM, you know, we always talk about environments. Our goal is to uh, create environments where you would love to hear and understand more about Jesus. The first thing is that environment has to be attractive. It has to be interesting. We want, that's why we do things like the video that you just watched. And we're limited in what we can do, but we'll try and do everything that we can do to bring something attractive, interesting to you that's not traditional, but that you can hear and will cause you to just want a little bit more of that. That's our goal. But it also has to be engaging. It has to be something that you, it, even if it's true, it has to be engaging. Sometimes you can talk about things that are true, but it doesn't get your attention. How many of you have ever listened to someone tell you the truth, but they don't have your attention? <laughs> Sometimes, you know, you, if, especially if, if the person doesn't, if the person don't already think it's something that's exciting, they may not be engaging. I mean, you don't have to get, for example, you don't have to, you don't have to do something to get someone's attention if they're already hungry for what you're about to say. I mean, like, um, I, was, I went to Thomasine's doctor with her this week, and, and she's talking about her eyes. I noticed Thomasine was leaning in, listening for every single word. You don't go when you got something going on, and, now, and you're just like, yeah, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And the doctor's telling you what's happening. And you go, yeah, yeah. Or especially back when, I, when we were going to her doctors when she had breast cancer and the other surgery that we had, it was, it was amazing. And, and she had some great doctors too. I mean, the one doctor, he knew he had Thomasine's attention. He had to cover up stuff he didn't want her to see yet. He would bring out his clipboard and put another sheet of paper over each line because he knew... <laughs> She was reading ahead. <laughs> but when, you, when somebody's hungry for that kind of information, you don't have to try and get their attention. But we want to be engaging here. We want to, you know, and that's for every, that's different for every age group. That we want to be engaging for pre-K. And, and I'm saying that because I am so excited that you brought your children today. And it's, it reminds me of what's in my heart for the environments that we are creating for every age group, for the pre-K, the babies, for, and it's not just babysitting. It's where we create an environment where they can make a connection, even at that age, to who God is and what love is, and make that kind of connection. And, and, and whether it's elementary school, whatever that age group is, create an environment for that age group, high school, junior high, for that age group, college, singles, married couples, singles with kids, every age group where we create environments for that age group and it's engaging for them at that age. But the third thing is also that it's helpful. And that's our goal is that it's helpful, not just true, but something that's practical, that's supportive, it's beneficial for you. You should be able to take something 
uh, away from here. Like today, we, we have prepared even printouts. If you want to take a, a hard copy with you of what we're talking about today so that you can apply it to your life, you can do that. Or you can download it, that same thing in a PDF form from our um, Facebook groups page. And so we want to be helpful so that you can take it and put it to work and make it practical. Here's what we say. We've said this about uh, GTM. We're a place where you can feel at home on the first time you come here, your first visit here. You don't have to, you can consider this your home church just because you came and visited. We're here, your home church, without filling out a membership card, without doing any kind of application. We're here. See, it's our desire to create environments, and that's our goal is to create environments that are progressive for life change, environments that connect people inwardly with themselves, but also vertically with God and horizontally with each other. We're connected. That's a true connection. When you are in tune with who you are and honest with who you are and not trying to... and See, that's why you have to create the environment because we don't naturally like to be open about who we are completely. But when we create the right environment where you can do that, and guess what? This is not that environment. <laughs> this environment that you're sitting in now is not where you open up and tell everybody everything. But we want to create an environment where you can be honest with yourself, open up about who you are, honest with, with the person, that is horizontally with them, and vertically with God. And our goal is to do this. We want to reach out to our local communities, to our online communities, and lead people. We want to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and equip them to serve and, and to bring glory to God. That's our goal of what we want to do here. And the reason I'm bringing this up today is because this weekend represents something that happened that our entire faith hinges on. Our entire faith hinges on this. But I've been reading and I've been watching and I've been listening to um, some information and I'm going to share some of this with you. As a matter of fact, here's some stats I want to share with you. Religious, there a group, there's this group of people that are what they call unaffiliated with any denomination, with any church. Not necessarily that they don't believe in God, but they're just unaffiliated. And, and this is, you can see what the percentages are. In 2007, there were about 16%. And this is from some peer research and different research groups. 2014, that was 22.8%. And, and I just have one year that's off because they did millennials. But if you just look at millennials, look at how many millennials in 2015, 34 to 36% of millennials are just saying that I am not affiliated with any religion. I'm not Christian, not Buddhist, not Muslim, not anything. And I'm just, and some of them would say I believe in God and some of them would say I don't. But in 2018, about 26% unaffiliated. And, and, and some of those are atheists. But this group is what we call, some of the, as we're familiar with, what we call the duns, people that are just kind of done with church. You're, we call those the duns. They're done with church. I've had enough. I, I talked to a lady not too long ago, and um, she said, I'm, I'm done. Either hurt at church or misunderstood at church, but something happened at church. And see, what I, what I don't believe is, I don't believe it was something that they understood about Jesus that made them not want to come to church. <laughs> something happened, and they're just done. But this group that I'm talking about now includes the duns, but these are just nuns. They're saying, when you give them a survey for what religion, they check the nun box. None. And there's been a rise of this group since some, one thing happened in our culture, in our world. Nothing had ever happened like this before. 
and this event that happened, you can track it and you can see how these numbers started to rise after that. You see, prior to 9-11-2001, many atheists at that time, they were okay with just leaving everybody alone. And many of them were quiet because, you know, they were very minor a minority group. It's like, atheists, you don't believe in God? You know, people look at them like, you're crazy. You know, there's some kind of God. So they just, they just, they just even thought, prior to 9-11, the atheists just thought that we were either just crazy or silly, and it didn't matter. They felt like we were harmless. If you, were, you believe, you're harmless. Any religion, you're harmless. But after 9-11, on 9-11, actually, when the attack, the terrorism that happened on 9-11, some of you probably can remember where you were at that point. I remember where I was. I remember where a good friend of mine and his wife were. They were in New York that morning. They had taken a vote. It was a group of them. And they had taken a vote whether they were going to go to the World Trade Center or go to the Statue of Liberty. And they decided to go to the Statue of Liberty that morning. But what else happened at this time was atheists, start, they started looking at the fact that the re, who, would, who would be willing to kill themselves just to kill a whole bunch of other people? And they realized that it's religion that did this. There were a number of books. So atheists began to war against all religion, but initially it was Islam and Muslim because of what had happened on 9-11. But they began to war against all of it. And, and then, uh, after a few years, they kind of turned towards Christianity, just against Christianity. Some of the books that, were, that are written by one by Richard, Richard Dawson, or Dawkins, God's Delusion, I've been reading that book, and I've been, and I'm reading it because I'm, I want to understand what they're doing, and I want to, I want to be able to talk about it like I am today. Because if we don't talk about it, that whole group of millennials, and not just millennials, but everybody else, these people are preaching this. They are, they're going on college campuses. They're opening up, and see, here's what's different about this. There, another. Before I say this, another guy, just if you're writing down his names or something, is Sam Harris. He wrote a book called The End of Faith. And a lot of us as Christians, we're afraid to pick up those kind of books. But I encourage you to read them because today I want you to realize that something actually happened. And a lot of times what atheists will tell you is that, well, th this part of the Bible is not true. And that part of the Bible you can't prove. And this part of the Bible doesn't agree with this part of the Bible. Well, I do know that this part of the Bible that we're talking about this weekend is not only in the Bible. Historically, it's true. You can find historical records that Jesus actually died. You know what? Every religion except Muslim believe that Jesus actually died and rose. It's in their history. You don't have to read their Bibles. They're, I mean, Jewish historians talk about it. Um, all the other historians talk about it. Different languages, they talk about it. That actually happened. It's, you can find it in history, in their history records. But Muslims believe, they believe that he was on the cross. They believe that he actually didn't quite die. Therefore, they don't have to believe in a resurrection. But these atheists and agnostics, they're going on college campuses, they're creating debates, they're doing the things that um, what, they set up an, an environment for you, and now it's all on the internet, and that's what's different. You can debate on the internet, that's how I can listen to it. I mean, there's, you, can, you can just, that means your 12-year-old can listen to it. And you might not want them to, but they need to 
be open and realize what is this, what this is and what they're saying. For example, here's a quote from Richard Dawkins. He says this. He said, he despises the people who believe something without evidence and then go out and take action that damages other people. Now you can see how he based this on especially the Muslim religion. They believe something so strong and have no evidence for it, but then they can go out and take action that actually damages other people. He says those whose religious beliefs are so firm and strong that it actually justifies killing people. And sometimes we would say, especially now in New Testament times, we would say, well, I'm glad I'm a Christian and I'm not one of those other religions. But, and, and, and to be fair, Richard does go on to say, I'm not talking about the people who are sitting in the pew on Sunday morning. They're harmless. But then he does go on and attack any, I mean, Christianity and other religions because he believes that blind faith, he believes that we follow blind faith because we have no evidence for it. Uh, with any absence of evidence, he calls that blind faith. But here's where, here's where I want to take a turn is because anything you believe, anything you, you have to believe, there's faith, scientists have faith. They have faith in their experiments and everything that they do. In other words, when we look at evidence, evidence is this. We usually trust scientific consensus. When, when, a, when the scientists do even any kind of research, when you do some research and you have peers look at it where it's peer-reviewed and now it's like in the archives and it's been added to the knowledge base of everybody. That's part of what research does, and you're, they're excited that you're doing this research. When you get this research, then other people read that research, and guess what? They believe it. They don't go and do the research over again. They quote you, and it becomes a base of knowledge. Well, We are, we're skeptical and challenged when we, accept these, when we accept these theories, but we usually trust other scientists' report on what they have seen. Now, we as Christians, we do the same thing when we look at Scripture in the Bible and what it's based on, but here's, here's the difference, and here's why some atheists say that we believe without evidence, and that is... Many times we look at scripture in the Bible and we think just because it's in this book of 66 books with a leather binding on it that now it's sacred and everything in here is true. And then when scientists try to disprove one thing or the other and say that this doesn't match that, then we look at them like they're crazy. But I'm saying we don't have to look at them like they're crazy. The Bible wasn't originally all in 66 books. But if you take, I just want you to take what we're talking about this weekend. Jesus Christ, crucified, risen from the dead. These were letters that were written about it, and these people kept these letters until eventually somebody put them in a book. But until then, there was no Bible, but these people believed something because something had happened. And that's what we want to talk about today. In this, from the book of 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Now, Paul, wow, Paul, <laughs> sound the same. The Apostle Paul, he was not a Christian when Jesus was on earth. He didn't follow Jesus. As a matter of fact, when he understood what was going on, Paul was a Pharisee. When he understood what was going on, what Paul did was he tried to shut them down. He tried to wipe Christianity out. And he wrote this book. He wrote most of the uh, New Testament, over a third of it anyways, two-thirds of it. And so Paul is saying something to us here. He's talking to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church had a lot of problems. But in this chapter, he's talking to them about the resurrection of Jesus. And he's saying to them, 
For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. So the first thing Paul is saying here is that according to, the, and when he says scripture, of course what he's writing hadn't been written yet, so he wasn't referring to New Testament scripture, he's referring to Old Testament scripture. So there's Old Testament scripture that predicts the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he's saying to them, Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. And he also says that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. In other words, he's three things here. He's saying he died, he was buried, and he was raised. Now let's go back to the first thing he said. He said, what I received, I passed on to you. He's saying, I have received this information. In other words, he's saying, it's not my ideas. I'm not trying to teach you something new. It's not, I didn't make this up. I didn't bring this up. I'm, what I'm giving to you is something that I've received. And where did he receive it from? Well, he goes on to say, and that he appeared. So now he said he, 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 he died and he rose and now he's saying he appeared to Cephas, which is Peter, and then to the 12, the rest of the disciples, actually the other 11, because Judas wasn't there. But then he, he said, and he appeared to Cephas, which is Peter, and after that he appeared to more than them. But let's back up. He's saying, why do you think he mentioned that he appeared to Peter? See, Paul and Peter ended up in the same area. Peter was with Jesus, but Paul wasn't. But now Peter and Paul is in the same time frame, during the same span, and they are interacting with each other. So Paul is saying, as a Pharisee, which he was, I know the scripture, and now here's Peter, who was actively with Jesus, and now here's Peter actively with me, because Peter didn't even quite trust him at first. Remember, Paul was trying to kill everybody that was talking about Jesus. And so now here's Peter and Paul on the same team. He's saying that Jesus appeared to Peter. He told me. He appeared. He saw him. You know, Paul is saying, at first, I didn't see him. I wasn't there. But here's a man that I see who says he was an eyewitness. And he appeared to him and then to the twelve. And then after that, he appeared to more than how many? 500 of the other brothers and sisters at the same time. And here's what's really interesting. He says, and most of them are still living. So at the time that he writes this, he's saying, you can go and talk to the eyewitnesses. They are still alive. Though some of them are dead, but you can go and talk to them. See, eyewitnesses, when people try and change history and they create legends, they wait for eyewitnesses to pass on, and then they change the story. He's saying, these eyewitnesses are still alive. I'm writing about this. You can go and check them out. But then he goes on and says, and then... After appearing to 500 people, and some of them are still alive, he goes on to the next verse and says, and then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Why, why single out James? See, James was Jesus' brother. And when Jesus was here on earth and had disciples, James was not one of them. James thought he was crazy. As a matter of fact, one day James and his other siblings went with his mother to go get Jesus and say, hey, what you doing? Come on, man, you're crazy. But here, after his resurrection, James, James see Jesus, who he saw die on the cross. And now he see him alive. And now James, Jesus' brother, accepts Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And he's talking to Paul. and all. James became the head of the church in Jerusalem. And he didn't even 
walked with Jesus when they were on earth, when Jesus was on earth. And here he is, he believes now, and he becomes the head of the church in Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, if you think about it, you know, when I, I think about this sometimes, because there's, there's certain people who, once, especially Jewish, there's a Jewish sect that believes that once they thought Jesus was the Messiah until he died. And then they say, well, Messiahs don't die. He's supposed to be a king. And so that wasn't him. It's not a wonder that they didn't say, well, and they had traced the bloodline back. Remember, this is why they could believe it. Matthew traced Jesus' bloodline all the way back to David, right? And which was traced all the way back to Abraham and through the tribe of Judah and all of that. Well, if Jesus was in that same bloodline, and that was through Mary, not Joseph, as far as that bloodline goes, so was James. So they could say, well, Jesus died. Maybe his brother's the one. But something happened that James didn't even let that happen. He said, no, I saw him die on the cross, and then I saw him alive talking to me. I am not the Messiah. He is the risen king. And then Paul goes on to say, last of all, he appeared to me as one abnormally born. And when Paul, what Paul is talking about, even after Jesus had gone back to heaven and after he'd appeared to all these other people, Paul was on his way to Damascus to put Christians in jail and Jesus actually stopped him. And that's when he encountered Jesus personally himself. And so many people say there's no resurrection. There's an impossible. Even though I just mentioned to you some history, you can go check it out for yourself. And this is how real this was to Paul and his audience at this time. In other words, they were, these people in Corinth, they were, they were talking about resurrection because there were some people telling them that resurrection is not real. Not just Jesus. They just don't believe in resurrection like the Sadducees. There's no life after death. And so Paul begins to explain to them how important this is not just Jesus, which he just talked about, but look at what he says. He said, down to, we go down to the 12th verse. He says, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Because that's what some of them were saying. Evidence, but we, he's saying here, we have evidence that's been passed on by what? Eyewitnesses. That's evidence. It's just like scientific evidence. It's passed on by eyewitnesses. They wrote it down. In other words, they saw it, they wrote it down, and passed it on what they heard. Evidence passed on by eyewitnesses. And then he says, so if there was no resurrection, if there is no resurrection, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. He says, so if there's no resurrection, that means Jesus didn't, he wasn't raised from the dead. And what do you think the next step of that is? <laughs> he says, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. And so is your faith and my faith. And if Christ, if it didn't actually happen, he's, this is what Paul is saying, if the resurrection actually did not occur, we're all fibbing. It's useless. It's nothing. So that's why I say the entire Christian faith hinges on the resurrection. The entire Christian faith hinges on the physical resurrection. He actually physically got up. Not that it was just written that he got up, but that it actually happened. And see, as a kid... I, had, I felt like I had to learn how to, well, I had to be careful because there was questions I had that, especially in, in, in the environment I grew up in, you just didn't ask questions because, you know, you, 
they may have thought that you weren't really saved. You, you weren't, it wasn't safe to ask the questions because then they start doubting you and you didn't want people to doubt you. And so I want to create environments where anybody can ask any question and say, I, you know, I'm not real sure about this, but here's what I like to believe. And so as we, as we move forward here and as I close and we go through a challenge, I'm going to present to you seven stages of what I call seven point, um, it's a seven point grid, basically. And who came up with it was this guy, Richard Dawkins. But we're going to do some homework on it this week. Okay? And so here's your challenge for this week. Your challenge is to take inventory of what you believe and why you believe it. What do I really believe and why do I believe it? What do I really, what do I believe really and why do I believe it? I went through this when I was in high school, my last couple of years in high school, and because I was, I've been saved and been a Christian since I was 11 years old. And then I began to go through junior high school and high school and going through biology and science and philosophy, getting into philosophy. And I remember I had a Jewish instructor who didn't believe the same stuff that I believe, and he didn't mind letting us all know what he believed. And I was challenged. And I was challenged because I, there was stuff I couldn't prove. There was stuff I felt like I needed more information about. And so I felt inadequate. So our challenge is to take inventory of what you really believe. I remember I was working. If you're from around here in Flint, remember there used to be a mire on Pearson Road. It was kind of new then, back in the early 70s. I was a uh, cashier, and there's times I go out. And there was, I remember this one time. I was dealing with questions so hard that I was so emotional, I couldn't stay in the store. I went outside and started pretending I was pushing carts in. I was crying because I was just, I wanted to believe, but what I had just discovered and learned about in class was just messing with me, messing with me, messing with me. And see, some of this stuff is messing with you, and if it's not messing with you, it's messing with your kids, it's messing with your grandkids, and we're just going on like, they're going to be just like I was. But they are being challenged. And we need to understand what we believe and why we believe it. And then move from the idea of blind faith. Move from the idea of blind faith to a belief that allows your intellect to be important to you. Because when I was growing up, that was basically what they said. Don't think, just, just believe. Just believe. Just have faith. That's really what they said. Just have faith. Just have faith. Just have, you know, blind faith. Just, and that's what I call blind faith. Just have faith and you don't ask questions and you can't understand it. That's not the way God designed us. God didn't design us to just blindly have faith and not ask questions. That's why you have a question. It's because he designed you to have a question. But allow your intellect to be informed by both the scripture and this main event that we're talking about in history that actually happened, the resurrection. Consider the eyewitnesses that saw him, that saw Jesus before he died and saw Jesus after he died, and they wrote it down, and that's why we have the documents that we have today during that first century, how those documents have been, they've been preserved and passed on. And then here are the action steps. Consider where you honestly find yourself on the seven-point scale and keep looking for evidence until you are a number one. There's a number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and a number one is a strong theist. So get used to those words, a person who's sure about God. So here's the seven-point scale. Number one, you're a strong theist. I do not question the existence of God. I know he exists. That's number one. Number two, you're a de facto theist. I cannot know for certain, but I strongly believe in God, and I live my life on the assumption that he is there, that there is a God. Some of you may find yourself in that category. That's a de facto theist. That's a number two. 
Number three is a weak theist. I am very uncertain, but I am inclined to believe. I'm very uncertain, but I'm inclined to believe. And we have printouts for you already, so you don't even have to try and write this down. You can take a hard copy with you, or you can download the PDF uh, from our, from our uh, Facebook page. But that's number three, a weak theist. I'm very uncertain, but I'm inclined to believe. Then here's number four. Number four is a pure agnostic. That's a person who says God existence and non-existence are exactly equiprobable. In other words, it's, there probably is a God and there probably is not a God. It's, that's a pure agnostic, and that's the definition of an agnostic. They're saying, I don't know, and almost like I don't care, but I don't know, and it's probable that he is and it's probable that he's not. That's a pure agnostic. Now here's a weak agnostic, number five. The weak agnostic says, I do not know where the God exists, but I'm inclined to be skeptical whether he actually exists. This information is all from an, a, the book of an atheist. But you need to know where you are on this line, because that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to recruit people to become a number seven, and I'm trying to recruit people to become a number one. Okay? So number five is a weak atheist. I do not know whether God exists or not, but I'm inclined to be skeptical. And then number six is a de facto atheist. He's saying, I, I cannot know. In other words, I cannot know for certain, but I think God is very improbable. I can't know for certain, but I think he's very improbable. And I live my life under the assumption that there is no God. So I assume there is no God. In other words, I arrange my worldview and everything in my world as if there is no God. That's a de facto atheist. And then a number seven is a strong atheist. He's saying, or she's saying, I am 100% sure that there is no God. So where are you? And at GTM... Our goal is to create an environment where you can be a number seven and come up in here and ask questions. We want to create the environment where you're anywhere on that scale, you can come here and be here. And that's our goal. Because my goal is to create number ones, people who believe in God and know for sure that God exists. But even though I've been a Christian since I was... At, well, since I was born, basically. But once I understood enough and made up my own mind, I was 11 years old. And from the time I was 11 through up my teen years, I didn't let nothing pull me back and away. But I was definitely challenged. I mean, I had challenges that you don't have today, but I had different kind of challenges, different things that... It wasn't so much about the Bible, it was my religion because of what, you know, our church taught that was either a misunderstanding of the Bible or it just wasn't in there anywhere. They, they, they made up things so that you wouldn't do the things that they didn't want you to do. So it was like, we're going to make up this stuff and this will be a guardrail so that they'll never do the stuff that they shouldn't do. So here's the guardrail. I mean, think about this. Through my teenage years, I couldn't play ball. Couldn't play ball? What's this got to do with anything? And you know, I've told you the stories. The first time I went bowling, I was hoping Jesus didn't come back and split the sky. I was like, oh God, I can't be out here bowling and he returns. I might miss the rapture. <laughs> so let's understand what we believe, why we believe it, and learn together to move towards trust. Because that's what faith really is. Faith is really trusting God where we learn to trust God with our entire lives, with everything about us, learning to, to trust God. And so, if you would, bow your heads. I want to pray for you. Father, we thank you today. You've been so good to us, and we thank you for what this weekend represents and, and the time that people all the way, all around the world are remembering this weekend. And also, even as we pray now, especially in Paris, where they've had the fire in the cathedral. 
and where they, where they believe that they still have the crown of thorns that Jesus actually wore. We thank you for just all of this that's coming together this week and this weekend. And we thank you for your life. Your, we thank you for dying for us. And we thank you for the resurrection that is so real and that we can live because you live. And we give you praise and honor for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You have a good week.